Hjertelig velkommen til et nytt program her på Israel-kanalen. Denne gangen så er vi i Haifa, nemlig på Haifa Universitet, og i arkeologilabben til Shai Bar. Welcome to the to Israel Canal's program, Shai. Thank you for hosting me again. Uh, you have been working with uh, Adam Sertal uh, in many, many years, and you were together with him when you uh, f with Alter and the Foot. Uh, well, how is the situation now? Well, I've been working with Zertal for about 15 years, before he passed away six years ago, and I continue all his projects in his memory. Um, the situation now is that we continue with the Manasha Hill Country Survey. It's a project that uh, Adam started in 1978, which make his, makes it actually the longest archaeological project in the world. So <laughs> that's wow. a lot of years, 45th year now. Um, and he's been surveying, we've been surveying by foot, the entire area of middle and northern Samaria, eastern Samaria, and the entire Jordan Valley until Jericho in the south. So it's like 15% of the modern state of Israel. Uh, every meter walked and document all the archaeological sites in that region. Uh, since Adam passed away, we continued this project, and uh, last year we published the eighth volume of this uh, project out of ten volumes planned in Hebrew. And this year already we published the seventh volume uh, in English by Yebril and Leiden, which is a very good uh, academic uh, publisher. And we hope to continue in the next years. What's new is that last Friday we started the survey of Mount Kabir. Mount Kabir is a very mm, massive ridge in the center of, uh, of the Samaria Mountains, not far away, a few kilometers east of Mount Eival and Mount Grizim. And this area was never surveyed before. It's the, one of the only places in Israel, I think, that an entire mountain, which is like uh, 20 square kilometers, has never been surveyed before, so we are very uh, interested and very anxious to see what, what is going to be found there. So, so this is, uh, you know, the, the hill that is very close to Elon More. Elon More is situated on the hill, actually. Okay. And yesterday, actually, we were walking in the suburb of uh, Elon More. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, and it's, it's uh, very important. And I think that maybe in two years' time, we will be able to tell all the secrets of this mountain, the ones that these archaeologists can still expose, of course. So this is like breaking new ground, because if you, uh, as you said, you have never been surveyed. So Adam mm, wasn't, wasn't there? No, it's the Manasseh Hill Country Survey reached this area from the north, from the east and from the west, and only parts from the south, and it was left. And also the other survey that was in the region, the Ephraim Survey, also reached just the base of the mountain. So the mountain ridge itself was uh, uh, never explored by archaeologists. So this is actually quite thrilling uh, to see what we'll find there. So on Friday, did you do any discoveries then? Well, on Friday, actually, we mostly got very wet yeah. <laughs> since it was uh, still a, a very wintry day in, uh, in Samaria. Uh, we discovered a few sites, a few small sites, mainly agricultural sites from the Roman period, because uh, this mountain was, uh, since it's a Mediterranean climate and, and it's very good for cultivation of uh, olives uh, and uh, grapes, so uh, we believe that it's going to be very rich in uh, farm, in, in agricultural sites, agricultural installations. And this will be probably very rich. And, and we just began, we did a 1% of the area or less, and, and still we found several sites that are significant. Uh, this sounds very interesting to find uh, new discoveries. But, uh, I'm curious, how, did you, how can you say that it was from the Roman period? Well, according to the shirt, the pottery that we found, it's typical of the Roman period. Every, um, it's like the main dating method of archaeologists is based on the finds, and, when, and uh, since the Neolithic period when people invented pottery or discovered pottery and the use of pottery, then um, we can quite, uh, quite rightfully, um, let's see, every 100 or 150 years there's a slight change in pottery production, in pottery typology, in the way things, the, the way different vessels look like, and we can follow this and we can give quite a precise date. It's not, it's not like very precise, it's not like 
radiocarbon dating or uh, these uh, more advanced methods, but this is the base to dating in archaeology. Yeah. Okay, so you found uh, actually pottery in, in the, on the surface? Yeah, the, since we are doing a survey, uh, the Menashe Hill Country Survey is a survey, not an excavation. In the excavation you dig to the ground, you find much more pottery, of course. And the survey is more intended at finding all the sites in a given area and try to date them and to create a map of different periods, let's say, the map of the Hellenistic period sites in Mount Kabir, the map of the Roman and the Byzantine period, of course, earlier periods until Ottoman periods. And the Ottoman period, which is the latest, which ended in World War I, uh, approximately 100 years ago. That, that's the latest period that we define. Okay, wonderful. Very interesting. Uh, so, uh, when are we going to go back to Mount Kabir? Well, hopefully uh, this Friday. Uh, the weather forecast is against us, unfortunately against, so we'll have to see the, the day before what's the condition on the mountain, because last, uh, last Friday it was like uh, in a fog. Uh, we felt like maybe in, in northern Scotland and not in, in the Middle East, uh, because it was very foggy and very rainy, it was very difficult to survey. So hopefully this Friday, and if the weather is still not uh, good enough, then we'll next Friday. Uh, anyway, we, we intend to come several Fridays uh, to the mountain to continue the survey, actually to really start it. Uh, when we back a little bit and goes to the, the, the foot shape uh, enclosures, enclosure. uh, yesterday I was able to find <laughs> my way to uh, the one in Yafit. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't, you know, as clear as the one in Argaman. Uh, are there more of those? Well, we have what we think are five foot shaped enclosures. Some of them are debated, of course, but the main one, best preserved and, uh, well, si slightly rebuilt or curated is the one in Argaman. And that's the, definitely the one that you can see actually the foot shape and you can see the different structures. Um, the other ones are uh, more, uh, are smaller. Argaman is the biggest, it's, it's 12 dunams, it's, it's, it's like more than a football ground. Yeah. The others are much smaller, depends which, and um, are archeologically harder to uh, investigate. They are less preserved. Um, so what we do is we excavate them and we actually, uh, during the COVID pandemic, we had two small excavations, one in the Argaman food shape enclosure uh, in 2020 and last year we had one in the Remonim, the Shab Romani, sm the smallest food shape enclosure, trying to better date them because they are very difficult to date. Um, so uh, we worked on the material and we discovered that they were built in two different periods. They were built in the beginning, they were founded in the Iron Age one, and then they were reused, uh, especially the one in Rimonim, in the Roman period, but also the one in Argaman. So some of the structures are uh, from the Iron Age and some are from the Roman period when they, the nomadic Roman population came to the region, saw all the stones, the structures, and reused them uh, for uh, animal husbandry in the case of uh, Argaman, and for threshing floors in the case of uh, Rimonim. Okay, so because of the, 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 the walls uh, already built a little wall, so they just enhanced mm, it? Yeah, it's very easy to, to reuse it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something very common because in most, in more than 80% of the sites in the Jordan Valley and in Eastern Samaria that we surveyed in the last 10 years, we found Roman pottery. That's the richest habitation period and they just went everywhere. And when they saw walls still protruding, they used, either used the stones or used the walls. If you are used, building a threshing floor, what you need is a small floor, a small wall, sorry, and, and, and a, a rock surface. And this is what you have in Vermonim, and it's fantastic. And we found there um, more than 25 pieces of basalt stone that were used in the threshing uh, procedures in the Roman period. Okay. So they came back, the site was neglected for thousand years and then they reuse the, the, the structures that were there. Uh, in the, when you did the excavation in Agaman, did you find anything new things? 
Well, for the first time we excavated the, the rounded structure, the circular structure, what we call the Bama, we named the Bama. It was not a biblical Bama, but we excavated the inside. We found, for example, that the wall that surrounded it is more than one meter wide, which is a very wide wall. And we find, found that it was founded in the uh, Iron Age one period, which is very important because this is the only, uh, the first time that we can actually date this feature within the site. Uh, on the contrary, or a different date was given to the uh, squarish courtyard in the middle, the higher, the higher courtyard, which is actually a, a Roman addition to the site, for example. Okay, so you can conclude with that that was the from site the was yeah. So for, for some example, this, the, 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 the square uh, courtyard in the middle is not Iron Age; it was added afterwards. The same thing in the Rimonim enclosure. The Rimonim enclosure is, uh, it is a, a small enclosure that was built in the Iron Age, and in the Roman period, they added three small cells to the Iron Age walls, and they use it to store probably the produce that they you, you do the, the, the threshing floor. They had to store it somewhere, so that's an addition. So that's that's the benefit of excavating after surveying, because in the survey you can give certain data. But when you excavate, you can look for better, better, better data, more, more accurate data. Mm. Uh, the site in Argaman, has, has it changed since, uh, did you uh, leave it as it was before, or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 uh, yeah, we, 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 you can see also the excavation. We just backfilled the, we, we excavated only less than half of the Bama, and we backfilled it so it can still be like a circular structure, not yeah. just something with a hole that somebody might fall or something mm. for more for safety reasons. Yeah. When I was at the, the Yafit uh, uh, food shape, it was like it was some squares in a line. Yeah, this is a section that was excavated at the site um, from uh, east to west in order to see the stratigraphy, the different layers. And also in your feet, there were, if you walk in these squares, you can see that there are small, small walls, and maybe if you've seen in the, these are Roman terraces. Uh, but the main uh, surrounding, it's not a wall, it's, it's, it's a paved circuit that surrounds the site is Iron Age. It's like actually very early Iron Age. It's from the transition from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age, something, let's say, 12th century BC. Uh, the purpose of these footsteps do you have any conclusion well, or ideas? Or I think that what Zertal suggested quite from the beginning, that these are gathering places for the population, for the nomadic population that inhabited the region, I think that this is still the best possible uh, assumption. Because every one of these food-shaped enclosures is encircled by uh, between 5 and fif or fi to 15 smaller enclosures, which are actually animal pens like modern Bedouins, but Bedouins from the Iron Age 3,000 years ago, nomadic population, that inhabited this specific region. We don't find it elsewhere in the region, o only in a very limited area north of Jericho and south of the Betjean Valley. So people uh, emigrated to this region, and these people needed a place for gathering, because everybody has his own tent and, and, and few sheep and goats, etc. But then if you want to gather, if you want to do something together, you create something larger. And that's, I think, that's the, these gathering places. Uh, Adam Zertal suggested that these are the Gilgal sites mentioned in the Bible. And I think this is a very good uh, possibility, uh, because these are gathering sites and cultic sites of the people of Israel when they entered Knat in the same period in the Iron Age one, according to the Bible. So, uh, and it is mentioned that, did, that they had these, there were few of these, and that they had uh, cultic proposals. For example, um, uh, Samuel crowned King Saul in the Gilgal, or the people of Israel that came after the 40 years of the Grand Desert tour, when they came to Jericho, to the Gilgal of Jericho, that's where they did the first Passover, and that's where they did the first Brit Milah circumcision. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are very important sites. And, um, and it's not a site, it's not a Gilgal, it's not a place of a name, but a type of a site, because the, in the Bible there are mentioned at least six different of these Gilgal sites, and all of them are mentioned in Eastern Samaria and the Jordan Valley. Mm -hmm. And all of them are mentioned in the uh, quite early books of Joshua and Judges, uh, which means Iron Age 1 according to the biblical chronology. So you have cultic sites in the Iron Age 1, 
in the eastern Samaria and the Jordan Valley. And these are possible gathering sites from the Iron Age one in the same location. So this makes this identification very, very plausible. Yeah. It's a little bit uh, confusing, confusing uh, to, to read the Bible and when you read Gilgal you think of it as one place. Mm, that's true. That's uh, because it's a, it's a name on a place. And, mm, that's true. And, but and but, then you've but that, that's the big, the big uh, understanding, not of Zertal or us, of course, of, of biblical scholars yeah. already knew. But, uh, but when you think of Gilgal and you, don't, and you think it's a place name, like today there is a modern kibbutz called Gilgal. But in the same area, but 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 this is a group of sites. It's a group. It's like saying fort, farm, city, village. You say Gilgal. It's a gathering place, a cultic place for the people of uh, of Israel. Yeah. When you look at the the the, the word itself, does it mean anything? Uh, Gilgal is, is is from Galgal. It's from something something circular. So that's the uh, okay. So the the circle also the circular shape. feature of the sh the shape is also something that is similar um, when you look at these sites, uh, these enclosure sites, my big enclosure sites. Okay. So uh, what I've heard uh, speculations about is that there may be one Gilgal for each tribe of uh, of Israel. I think that that's. Uh, not even speculation, because it doesn't say anything about it in the Bible. So it's, it's speculation, and I don't know what, what it is based on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. it's, I think it's a problematic spe speculation, because if it was written in the Bible that every uh, tribe had a Gilgal, then you can say, okay, but these Gilgals are only located in a very limited, I don't know, 20 kilometer stripe in north of Jericho. So where is the Gilgal of the tribes that are in the north or in the south or in the west of the area of eastern half Manasseh and uh, Benjamin, maybe and maybe Ephraim? But, yeah, but then again, could it be like it, uh, you know, in, within a certain time frame after the you know initial uh... entry to the? To... It's 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 a speculation without any f thing in the field in the archaeology to support it. So people can, of course, say, speculate what they want, but then we'll have to find 12 of these. Yeah. We finished now all Eastern Samaria until Jericho. We cannot enter, of course, Jericho. It's in Area B, but uh, also it's mostly built. So I don't think that if there was something there, it probably did not survive. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't see more than five. And five also, you know, some of these fives are also debated. Uh, we, we, even within our group of researchers, we are not sure that every, all the types are completely grouped under these foot-shaped enclosure types. Some of them are maybe different types of site from the same period by the same population, but different types. Yeah. Uh, there was one uh, foot shape that uh, Adam Sertal found in Masua. Yeah. And uh, today, I don't know if there are any remains left of it. Unfortunately, it was uh, destroyed during uh, unauthorized uh, construction there. And I'm still... It was very hard. It was the, the most difficult one to find because it's, it's very, very um, fragile. It was very fragile and it only had a few walls, a few things. We were not sure if it is a foot-shaped enclosure. Uh, so I still hope that maybe some of it e may be found within the, in this new construction area, but I'm not very optimistic. I think that it was destroyed. Yeah, that's a shame. That's a big shame, a very big shame, yeah. I'm fighting all the destruction of antiquity in Samaria, and uh, I don't want to get into political issues, but most of it is done by um, one party to the conflict. Yeah. And this is a case where the other party to the conflict, which is us, uh, made this uh, terrible injustice to, 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 to our heritage, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, when, we, when we take a look at the, the site at um, uh, Mount Ebal, that was also subject to damage. Yeah, yeah, twice in the last two years. Since the COVID pandemic hit uh, the region, hit everywhere, of course, um, I can, we, we can see a, a rise, a big rise in destruction of antiquities in Samaria. I can see it in Samaria, I guess it's everywhere. 
and this and it also they hurt uh, Eval in at least two different uh, occasions. One, uh, Eval is surrounded, the, the main structure there uh, is surrounded by two enclosures. By the way, they have a shape of a shoe footprint also. And the larger enclosure, well, its wall, about 30 meters of its wall, were destroyed by a Palestinian building a road from the nearby village of Asira Shamalia to Nablus to Shechem. And they dismantled the wall, the outer wall of this compound, of this enclosure, to take the stones and make, um, make a road, a modern road out of them, which is very, very uh, unfortunate. And the other case is uh, destruction within the main uh, site where they burned something there. But yeah, that's a problem. Is since the site is in area B, uh, it's very hard to to safe keep it, and and uh, everybody can go there and make a destruction. And we are archaeologists and and people that guard antiquities. We arrive there once in a week or two weeks, but all the other time it's it's empty to to and it's and people can destroy it, and it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, when that, that happened to that place, I read in the papers, uh, in the Israeli papers, that, that it created a big uproar even to the highest level of the government. Uh, can there be a, you know, a political solutions to acts like that? First, I have to say I'm not a politician. Yeah. <laughs> First thing. <laughs> and, but I was, several, I was twice in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament, uh, to talk about destruction of antiquities in Samaria or threats to antiquities in Samaria in different occasions. Uh, this is a political solution to, to take out. Uh, Mount Eval, the site is just a few meters out of Area C. It's just uh, such a poor decision when deciding to put the lines, between the boundaries between the different uh, unit, the political units. Somebody, I hope it was not on purpose, put it outside. Uh, which means that in area that I cannot go and do further research at the site and I cannot safeguard the site. I is Israeli archaeology. Um, so what can we do uh, is a, a political question. Uh, but I certainly hope and we are working very hard that some, uh, you know, there is another site, we can talk with the other side. Uh, for them it's also, it can be a touristical site. Um, uh, we are working very hard on this. A group of many good people are trying to, to see what can be done. What can I, when I, another thing I can say, and this is very important in, in the uh, Montival issue, is that finally after more than 40 years since the excavation, you know that the main problem of this site, and the main problem that part of the academic world is not accepting it, as the site mentioned in the Bible, is that it was not archaeologically fully published. And we are starting uh, in a few months to work on the final publication. And I really hope that in about two years' time from now, we'll be able to present the final archaeological pub publication of the site that will surely raise again the debate in the academic world, which neglects this site. I think it's very, in a very um, non-professional way, but uh, uh, neglects the site. And I think that Doing this is maybe one of the most important things that is going to be done by, by our team in the next few years uh, and finally give the, 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 the general public and, of course, the archaeology world a final archaeological uh, solution to what was there with all the necessary data, very large work, uh, more than 1,500 pages of work probably, um, but eventually it will give the skeptics and the uh, believers uh, the data, the real data that they can argue on to, yeah. to, to base their claims. Mm. Uh, so this is another very thing, important thing connected to Ivan. And I hope that if this uh, makes uh, this report will all also help will help to safeguard the site because both sides will understand its importance, and and hopefully it will also be. Uh, some method of salvaging this very important site because um, legally our hands are tied. Yeah, that, that's the problem. Yeah, uh, we uh, Israel uh, Canal uh, Israel Channel is supporting your work. Um, do you uh, uh, 
what else uh, do you do to raise funds by uh, other than donations? We mainly, there is a problem. As you know, probably, the academic world uh, and uh, the European Union and uh, other uh, big forces with big money are uh, considering Samaria and Judea and Samaria and occupied territory and the Hague Convention and everything. This prevents uh, our team from uh, uh, looking for funds in the uh, academic world, which is usually the, the biggest fundraiser for archaeology. Therefore, we are supported by personal people, by private people who donate uh, money to support our projects. Um, this is how uh, a very generous donation will help now publish Mount Eval. If it's not for this donation, I don't know when we could start working on this material. Because this costs money, of course. This costs a lot of money, yeah. 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 Well, okay, thank you for your information about uh, th these projects that you are working with and I just wish you uh, blessings in the continuation of your work and that you may, may find really good uh, <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, results. Thank you very much and thank you all the good people in, Nor in, uh, in the Scandinavia and especially in Norway for helping us to achieve these goals. Thank you. Ja, det var det vi hade för den gången. Jag hoppas du har lärt något nytt om det som har med arkeologi i Manassa-området att göra. Tusen tack för att du har följt oss och på ensyn igen nästa vecka. Tack för det.